Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence... <laughs> ...in the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, 
to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. Let me get right to my guest. Uh, my guest, my first hour guest is Alan Watt, and Alan has been fighting to wake up America for more than a decade, saying people need to understand history before having a grasp, a good grasp on what is happening in America today. According to, to Alan, who has meticulously studied history to find the answers, the Illuminati's main goal is to wipe away free will and individualism. Uh, Alan, how are you today? Oh, fine. Those were, and I, I assume you listened to the, those words by Kennedy, which were lost and somehow recovered 40 years. Weren't those powerful words? Uh, did you get a chance to listen to that tape? Uh, I put the video up on the weekend. Yeah. Now that's it. That's where I got. Thank you so much. I yeah. knew it all came together. Uh, and uh, anyway, what, tell, tell us what, you, what your thoughts were after you heard that. Well, I always knew that. Uh, I remember that uh, in Britain they played uh, that speech, in fact. Uh, on the BBC uh, when they were actually discussing Freemasonry at one point. This was years ago when I was small and so I hunted it down. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I knew there were big movements uh, at play between the um, world powers. Uh, the, the, the dialectic was going on. The Russian movement, the Soviet movement was uh, being hyped up mainly in the U.S., not so much in Britain. As I was growing up, I realized that Britain already was a socialist country. Mm -hmm. And then when I went into the history, this is before high school, I went into the adult libraries and checked it all out. And I found, sure enough, um, there was data, recorded data from books written during the Bolshevik Revolution um, concerning the banks of the U.S. and Britain funding the revolution and actually um, helping to, to get uh, the Soviet system up and working. And I thought, well, in other words, the, the elite of the world, um, the moneyed people, the, the establishment, as they call it in Britain, were backing the Soviet Union, which was supposed to be your enemy, sworn to destroy you. And that's your classical dialectic there. To get the world that they wanted to come out of this, it was the outcome when you fuse the two together, which is a sort of fascist elite at the top, uh, running a world uh, with bureaucrats running the people beneath in a communistic fashion, that's what they're now calling the third way. And right. that Go was ahead. how they did it, yeah. So tell us, you know, you, you make it a point to emphasize the fact of looking back into history and covering the things that have been... Uh, kept from people and I've had a number of guests on the show I've tried to do that on this show and that is to bring on people who have done the research have done the legwork like yourself to try to piece together uh, this hidden history that's left out of our books left out of libraries uh, with a concerted effort to shape and pattern uh, a, a certain type of individual or take away that individualism uh, yeah. so why don't you give us kind of your take on the whole uh, situation and start from where you think it's important and build us up to today and then of course I want you to try to give us some hope and uh, uh, some solutions. Go ahead. Well, In the third book I put out in the Cutting Through series I go through what we call civilization, the meaning of civilization which was the introduction of a monetary system which spread from the Middle East all over the world in ancient times and then brought the merchandising, the loaning of money to countries. And it, what they were able to do then is create a, a middle class, you might say, or an aristocratic class of thinkers. That's how you end up with all the Greek philosophers. They were wealthy people who would sit and discuss things like think tanks, you might say. And, and this has been their system ever since, with a definite agenda towards world conquest. And uh, Plato himself wrote about this in the Republic, and he was a member of the, the aristocracy of Greece. He himself, along with the rest of them, were, were trained in Egypt by Egyptian priests for 20 years for their mission. So he was, a, he was one of the original New World Order members. Huh? Yes, they, they wanted an ideal society. Also, the biggest problem was always maintaining control over the population, the people, the ordinary people, and getting to them to work either for free or for very little. No wonder they don't like Americans now. You know, because they can see the independence that used to be the trait of an American society that they're yes. slowly wiping away. Go ahead. 
Yeah, independence. The, the, the original thinker is, is hard to predict. You, you never know what he's going to say or do next. And one person, one person who can say the king has no clothes can just break the spell so quickly. And that's why we're going under totalitarianism and total information network, is to get all information from everyone so that we're all very predictable. And I thought that the term interdependence, you'll hear this from the United Nations, we must create a world of interdependence. That's why your harbors are being sold off to foreign uh, nations or peoples. And, uh, and your manufacturing, too, is being sold off to other peoples. It's for the world to be interdependent, which is the opposite of independent, you see. Right. And that doesn't stop with countries. It's to come down to the individual, where eventually you won't be able to have a garden and grow your own food, because that's, that's independent. And being independent under the, the Soviet or the new Chinese communist rules means you're anti-social. All right, listen, let's take a break, a three-minute break here. We'll be back with Alan Watt, and then we can go back into history and piece together how they are bringing the destruction of America right before our very eyes. Okay, we are back. Uh, second half hour of the investigative journal. And before I get back to my guest, Alan Watt, I wanted to ma I was just remind you, I promised to read that short paragraph uh, uh, email from Sister Catalina, who's trying to determine who the real spiritual controllers of the New wor World Order really is. And uh, I will do that at the top of the hour, along with updating you on that Vatican lawsuit and some uh, startling information that we uncovered uh, that Jonathan Levy, the attorney, did in a recent deposition regarding the rat lines and the involvement of certain high-level officials in the church and the American government. And uh, we've got uh, some part of the testimony from William Gowan, who was a uh, CIA agent that testified recently regarding that connection, uh, which... Uh, fits into what we're doing today. But anyway, we're back in history with Alan Watt. He's giving us, um, a, you know, just a great rendition of how this has happened to our country going back years and years and years. And I broke, uh, I broke in and interrupted you, Alan, so uh, pick up where you left off. Yes, the, the, the thing is, I mean, in the, in the 1700s, the elites of Europe uh, had meetings in, in Europe. And uh, they wanted a world society. It was first discussed by John Dee in the 1500s when he approached Queen Elizabeth I with his proposal to create a British Empire. And uh, he said it would be based on a form of free trade mm -hmm. and that countries that would not join it would simply be embargoed and, and uh, left out to dry until they conformed. But he also said that uh, the founding nation didn't have to be the one that would eventually lead the world into it. They needed a, a knight in shining armor, you might say. Uh, Britain was so well known for, for pillaging other countries, or England was, and uh, so was France and some of the other biggies. So they needed a brand new country, and that is why the U.S. was founded. The U.S. was founded by Freemasons. Mm -hmm. that's, that's common knowledge. Right. And there's many paintings in Washington with his Masonic regalia on. And he got a brand new obelisk built in his memory. And an obelisk in Egyptian terms was only given a brand new one dedicated to a person when he was raised up to godhood. That's what it meant, apotheosis. Mm -hmm. And so the, the U.S. was created to bring in the new world order and take over from Britain. And that's exactly what it's done. Now, uh... When you say we were created for that, give us a little bit more background and then tell us how the why it's taken so long. I guess people would ask that question uh, if we were created for that. What was the uh, what what happened? Uh, who stood in the way of this? And, and no one really stood in the way to be honest. They have their timetables and they work in centuries. And and, and these big the real societies work like long-range business plans and they work centuries ahead. They did the same thing in the Middle Ages when they built the cathedrals and it would take five or seven generations of stonemasons to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're so used to seeing something completed in our own lifetime. Uh, we can't imagine uh, things going on that we will never see finished, but these guys do. And it's a power-controlled uh, structure with archives of information as opposed to public libraries, and they have their agenda. Um, if you read the, the... I try to read the books by 
uh, written by the people concerned, not about them. And so read the Benjamin Franklin's diaries. And he tells you right in there that he envisaged uh, the United States Federation beginning being the beginning of a federation of the world, which would be run by 12 wise men, a government of 12 wise men. And Thomas Jefferson in his memoirs said the same thing. All right, well, take us back and bring us up to date, uh, basically, on your reading through history. Well, how long, well, you, oh, you, you talk about centuries. Okay, tell, take us back to, uh, you know, that period of time. Bring us up to date now and tell us what you, you think is going to happen in the near future. Well, in the near, near future, it's actually out in the open because uh, people have forgotten about the free trade negotiations, uh, the, the FTA that came out before NAFTA. Okay. And that was going on in the late 80s when Brian Mulroney was in power in Canada and Bruce Senior was in power. And uh, they signed the FTA and Shelley Ann Clark, uh, who was a, the most senior civil servant in Ottawa, in the parliament of, in Ottawa, uh, did all the books for the, for the negotiations. And she came out publicly and said they're merging the countries by 2005. And, and lo and behold, last uh, year, on the 27th of March, 2005, at Waco, Texas, the Bush and um, Martin and Fox signed the United uh, Americas Pact. They said on television here in Canada they had five more to go. Um, Tom Clark from Global uh, Network News stood up and said, this sounds just like the European Union, is it? Mm -hmm. And Martin stepped in right away and said, well, it's not quite the big bang. We have five more meetings to go. But he didn't deny it. And yeah. that was the, the beginning. By 2010, we have to be totally merged with, with the borders down, which means we'll have to have the, the whole continent ID'd by then to allow us to travel back and forth. So you're talking by 2010, they want this whole thing to be in place then, correct? Uh, yeah, and, work, and functioning too, yeah. I guess we could spend a couple of minutes. Tell us um, what's your take, since you've been reading all this, what's your take between now and 2010? What's going to happen if we don't step in the way and stop these people? Uh, well, we know where they're going. It's to be a world that's totally controlled. The individual will, will won't be able to move without permission. Uh, ultimately, if we go back into the books of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which is the British version, and all British Commonwealth countries, including Canada, has that department. Um, and they've been on television here, in fact, before they signed the Waco deal, publicly saying on behalf of the CFR from their main headquarters that they had drafted up the plans for the unification of the Americas. The CFR came out and said that on national television here. All right. So how, do, how does the whole picture fit in with the Middle East, with us, mm -hmm. uh, and with Europe? How do you view this? Yeah, well, they started the, the, the big takeover for the world's resources in the days of Cecil Rhodes, who created Rhodesia. And he belonged, he created the, the, the scholarship for the Rhodes Foundation dedicated to world government. So all Rhodes scholars are sent out into the world and to other governments. Uh, and you have quite a lot of them in your bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic departments in, your, in the federal government. And they're dedicated to uh, world government. That's their goal. And Cecil Rhodes uh, was sent out by the Rothschilds and Lord Milner, Lord Al Alfred Milner, to the Round Circle Society, which merged with the Rhodes Society. And they were sent out to take over the world's resources uh, in preparation for a global structure to be run by international corporations. And that's happening today. Uh, then we had Professor Carl Quigley, who picked Bill Clinton to, to be a Rhodes Scholar. And, and Carl Quigley wrote in his book, The Anglo-American Establishment, the whole agenda for world unification. Uh, and uh, the fact is that a new feudal system will be born where international corporations will decide the fates of the nations. They will be the new overlords. Yeah. And that's already happened because most politicians, as you know, in the federal government, it doesn't matter what party they belong to, uh, they've been CEOs of big corporations, and they move in and out of politics and back to the corporations uh, quite easily. Um, and it's the same in all uh, countries in the world now. So this system's up and already in place. We've been run by international corporations. 
Okay, how does genocide fit into this and the fact that there uh, statements have been made in uh, writings regarding uh, the depopulating of the world? How does that fit into this uh, whole plan and from your... Uh, the, uh, again, it's, they've written about this extensively. H.G. Uh, Wells, who was a front man for the... He was a Fabian Society founder. Um, he published a lot of work on this, non-fictional work, as well as his fictional work. But he said um, that the world was just run too inefficiently, and people were born, put through a system, and then expected to find their own place in the world and compete. He said this the system we shall create uh, with a much uh, reduced population. He said no one will be born without a function to serve the world state. And he said uh, the careers of everyone will be chosen for them by the state. And that's what school to work is all about. It's based on the Soviet system, which truly was the laboratory for all of this. Yeah, and I think that's kind of what I want to get at here. Uh, once we get past, uh, we're, we went back to uh, the formation of America, and we moved ahead. Uh, did you want to spend any time in the Civil War period? Well, the Civil War period was, again, a takeover from a corporate north to mainly an agricultural south. It was a land take, a resource takeover again of natural resources and a unification of a culture. Now, it was interesting that Karl Marx, and you'll find this in your own congressional records, um, uh, wrote a letter to Lincoln congratulating him uh, on, on unifying the country. He said, we need a strong central government. And that was the fundamental core for, for communism, was a strong, uh, overbearing central government. So this was part of the agenda for world domination. So then we move forward, of course, and um, I wanted to take us into the World War II period and how you think that relates to what's happening now as mm -hmm. far as the, you know, the strengthening of the Soviet bloc and then also uh, the Nazi movement yeah. and the relationship of our country with that, uh, with other powers that may be like the Vatican and other places. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think all these big structures, if you go into history, you'll find all the big structures of control and religion, they're all part of the one and the same thing. Um, to rule society, you must always have threats from somewhere. And so they create divisions within society uh, and use religions, especially in the past, to, to have them fight each other. And then they step in with all the rules and regulations to, to, to keep the peace, which takes away your rights. So there's always a uh, divide and conquer going on, and there's no way the Vatican could ever have been um, going independent in any way at all. Um, you'll find at the top levels of the CIA, MI5, Mossad, MI6, they're all one. The mm -hmm. departments which have all combined long ago. Right. And you cannot have a secret uh, independent nation today without being infiltrated. And you couldn't have a secret uh, uh, Vatican Association without being infiltrated, too. Right, and that's the real, that's the interesting part about this, is how they have organized this worldwide network. And, you know, how people probably wonder, well, how do they get involved in our government, in the American government? How did they work their way and take over the Congress? How did they work their way and take over the judiciary? And uh, how did they take over the CIAs? Who's doing this? And if so, who is over on the other side, in, in Russia, in China, working together with these people? Well, how we, know, we know who they are because uh, uh, if we go back to, to one group, and only one group is always mentioned as though they were the only group, but that was the Weishaupt Illuminati. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole foundation of the Weishaupt's idea, which wasn't his, it was a worldwide movement already, had been for hundreds of years, but uh, they wanted to create a world uh, um, run by an intellectual elite. They mm -hmm. called it the, nar the natural aristocracy. And that's the same term used by... Um, by uh, uh, Jefferson, in his own book, he said the, the natural aristocracy should rule the world. By that he meant the intellectual, scientific elite. And so um, that's what we have today. We have now Weishaupt said um, uh, he coined the term global citizen. And if you go into the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Weishaupt said it, we shall create philanthropic organizations which will fund NGO groups, basically which will speak on behalf of the public and demand 
changes. Well, that's how all laws come into force now. The, the big uh, NGO groups are funded by the big foundations, and, uh, and uh, they pretend to speak on behalf of the public, and then the, the government's only too happy to put the laws on the books for the changes they want. Now, Rockefeller himself, I've got a tape, a videotape, where he's giving out awards for global citizenship. Just like Weishaupt's Illuminati. Exactly. And, you know, just a couple of minutes before this break, I just wanted to ask this question, and we can go talk about it afterwards. But, you know, when you look at what's happening in the Middle East, the war on Iraq, it appears to be orchestrated by more than just uh, coincidence, uh, mm -hmm. orchestrated by a number of different uh, high-level people from different countries all working together. Uh, and the upcoming war in Iran, if that occurs, which most people say it's not uh, if but when. How, in a sense, do you view these people uh, moving forward with these agendas? I mean, they have to be on the same page. They have to have a, a network of communication. So yeah. how does China, Russia, America, and other countries, Mexico, we could probably add all of them members, work together? What is the uh, network that helps them communicate or get on the same page. For example, we're going to have a war on terrorism and mm -hmm. use the Muslims. Yeah. How, do we, how does this work in your mind? It's done through international law from the United Nations. Okay. And it's interesting that every country after 9-11 were asked to sign uh, the agreement on anti-terrorism and put the, all the laws into effect at the same time. And pretty well every country has done it. Um, the exact same laws. Finland's got it, uh, Norway's got it, Sweden's got it. Nothing happens in those countries. Uh, and here they are wondering why their governments are running around and shouting terror, terror. Uh, this is being used as an excuse to bring in the new agenda, the totalitarian system. But it also tells you that the communication of the department heads and the bureaucracies in all these countries are interconnected from a central source. The central source is the UN because H.G. Wells, when the, the, the League of Nations was set up uh, at the time of the First World War, uh, he said this is the end of national governments. He says bureau bureaucrats, top-level bureaucrats, can leave their department and go straight to a counterpart within the United Nations, bypassing the politicians. And that's what they've been doing for the last hundred years. You know, I wanted to ask you this question after the... I'm going to ask you the question now, then you think about it during the break. But pretend that I am a regular American living in 2015 here. Okay? Pretend that 10 years or 11 years has passed, and I'm living in uh, just a regular state in America, and if things go on the way they're supposed to, I guess we're at a critical period now, exactly what would my life be like in all aspects, from education to uh, travel to, uh, you know, the whole uh, to government? How is the government going to look? Is it going to be just structured the same, but then again, all all choice taken away? In your mind, what do you think is, you know, it's an interesting question. Place ourselves 15 years. We're going to pretend when we come back that it's um, 15 years from now. And tell us if we don't step in the way, if we don't positively do something to get rid of these people, what our life will be like. We'll be back with Alan Watt. Okay, it's the year 2016, and uh, I've decided to move way up into the Colorado Rockies, so away from these uh, people, and to uh, enjoy the remaining years of my life. And I start to wonder and ask a friend of mine next to me, what's going on in, in the Middle East and in Israel? Alan, what do you think in 2016, if we don't stop these people, that, that place will look like? Uh, it will be one big uh, block, basically, uh, the Middle East. Um, mainly for the natural resources, but as far as America goes and the rest of the world, uh, we'll be in our habitat areas to have read Agenda 21 from the United Nations. Uh, the habitat areas, they want everyone off the rural areas uh, that they don't need anymore. Uh, corporate farms only will be doing the farming. Um, there'll be no private property uh, in these habitat areas. There'll be rental only. Um, Lord Bertrand Russell put out a book, The Impact of Science on Society, and he, The Education and the Good Life, and he said, um, he said that the public will be given so many credits by the state at the beginning of every week, and you can't save them up. You must use them all up, uh, and you start at the same figure the next week. 
Uh, and if you go against the system, uh, they will use that as a form of punishment by withholding your credit so you can't buy food and you can't pay your rent. Uh, there will be no uh, public or private vehicles either. That's the other part of the, the UN uh, Biodiversity Treaty, Agenda 21. So this is all interrelated. It's a planned society. We've seen family planning. Now it's global planning. And we will have no decisions to make on our own at all, basically. What about our government? Of... Let's say I want to go out and vote in 2016. Uh -huh. What will that be like? Um, I don't even know if there will be votes by then. We won't, probably won't need them. Um, or else your vote will be a, 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 it's like Britain. Britain is now a, has a regional vote um, because they're part of the union. Uh, so the federate, uh, the, your, your actual um, uh, national government will actually be a local government. Uh, that, that's the status it will have. And who will be in control, for example, when we say the President of the United States, uh, what will that would entail uh, in, 20, 000, in 2016? Not much more than he is already. He's a front man for the corporations above him, for the big uh, moneyed boys who, who run the world, basically. Every president and prime minister goes cap in hand when they get in to office uh, to, to see how the debt situation is. They have to go into the big bankers, and uh, they know the big bankers can, can sink their country tomorrow if they want to. So basically, it's going to be the you know the same as it is now, except we'll know what they're they're actually just going to tell us it uh, that yes. way instead of lying to us and telling us we're free. Correct? Yes, and and really, when you have a, um, a uh, an international government running you, you're so remote from them, you're now an outpost, really, and you can't take your complaints anywhere because it's so far away. That's already happening in Britain and other countries. Uh, Brussels doesn't listen to them. You know what? I, I, if you could stick with us after the hour, I've got to uh, pass a few messages along after this short break. Then we're going to come back and do another segment with Alan Watt. And I want to hear some solutions and some hope. Okay, we were uh, we're still in 20, year 2016, in uh, 2016, and we're talking to Alan Watt. We're going to take a few minutes here. i got a few messages to bring across, and after this short segment of three or four minutes, we'll get back and finish up with uh, Alan Watt and uh, talk about uh, some other things that uh, we have to look forward to uh, in the year 2016 if we don't uh, radically change this new world order agenda, which is moving along full steam and has been doing, been going on, uh, according to Alan and many other researchers, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we just happen to be uh, luckily at the tail end of it, right? Uh, yeah, uh, but we got to deal with it, and hopefully we can stop it. Uh, let's uh, get back to what I was saying. I, I promised to read this message from Sister Catalina. And she's a Catholic nun who uh, wants to alert people also of the feared Jesuit order and in our quest to figure out that word secret in uh, the secret societies and the secret people taking over America in order to stop these people. Uh, you can't forget about the Catholic Church, the Vatican, and the Jesuit order and their role worldwide in this uh, global domination plan. So uh, she is writing, Sister Catalina, who has inside information regarding this order and the Catholic Church, uh, to uh, Bobby Lametta, who is a Filipino. Uh, he's from the Philippines, and he's a freedom fighter, also talking about what's happening to his country and connecting the dots to the Jesuits. And uh, Bobby's fearing for his life right now, uh, emails me constantly just to keep track, and I want to keep his name out in the public to help him, because he's a long way away, and he's asking Americans to look at what's going on there in order to protect his country and ours. And this is Sister Catalina, when Bobby proposed that the Jesuits were bringing down his country along with crooked politicians, and she says, uh, Dear Brother Bobby, you are 100% correct. As a former member of the Zionist, one, a Zionist organization of America, I can promise in the name of Jesus that these Jews that I was involved with are totally praying for peace and goodwill from their enemies. They wish no harm done. However, please read the book, The Keys of This Blood, uh, and in it, the Pope states that the uh, minimists, uh, the Jews, Muslims, and Christian fundamentalists such as Baptists and the SDA must become part of the final, final solution. 
Therefore, since Jews would not kill, uh, they are strict of the holy laws of God. Then the Jesuits are indeed the treacherous, vile creatures that are plotting everyone's demise, as you said, like a cancer. Many blessings in Jesus' holy name, Sister Catalina. Well, anyway, uh, you can learn a lot about what's going on in this country by finding out what's happening in other countries. Uh, there is a total blackout of the news here. We are in a corporate dominated, as Alan Watt has told us. I mean, every possible uh, way we look to get at the truth is blocked. And we are, are either lied about, lied, uh, lied to, uh, if not lied to, we are taken in different directions uh, we are then um, all the uh, criticism then is to be deflected and you can see one by one as dissidents speak up in America and I've brought on three or four or five on my show who are now in jail for trying to talk out and speak out in many different ways in this country to uncover this corruptness at every level of government in the religious organizations and uh, so on and so forth this shows you we need need to find out uh, really who is behind it and we will continue to do that on this show and we'll be back okay rolling right along here on the investigative journal my guest is alan watts and we're uh, trying to figure out what life is going to be like in this country in 2016 if we don't do something uh, right now alan we're about 300 uh, million strong in this country uh what's the population in 2016 if the powers that be have their way with us Oh, vastly reduced. Uh, I think Jack Trousteau gave a, a talk to a, a magazine, um, and he talked about bringing it down by at least three quarters. They don't need the population now in a highly technical society. Um, they don't need all the, the work, all the hands, all the labor. And so they, their perfect world will be vastly reduced to but at least, least a quarter of what it is today. So how are they going to do that to us in the next 10 years? Well, they've had think tanks at the UN working on this kind of thing, and uh, they talked about using all means possible. Uh, Arthur Kostler wrote the book The Ghost and the Machine while he worked at the United Nations, and, and we talked about ways of lobotomizing the public um, uh, by chemical means, injections, spraying it on them, putting it in the food, putting it in the water, and I think they've been doing all of this because people uh, are sort of dreaming through their lives here and they're oblivious of the dangers around them. So we're 300 million strong. Uh, we're still 300 million strong. Maybe mm -hmm. a lot of uh, the 300 million uh, are just, like you said, uh, oblivious to what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do? I mean, they're going to get us in one way or the other, whether it's through constant war, which is depleting the populations of Iran, Iraq, and that that region, and Israel, and then perhaps even here. Do you do you, do you think there's an invasion looming in the next ten years of this country? Uh, only if they bring on a some kind of disaster. Uh, Kissinger made a speech in California that the people would welcome in uh, the United Nations foreign troops under the right circumstances, and they certainly have the power to bring anything on like that. And they can also bring it on under a plague if they want to release a plague. And people should realize that every major country has <laughs> the departments of bacterial warfare and viral warfare where they have tremendous weaponry. And they've had it since before World War II. And uh, they can create any kind of disease they want. They have diseases which are programmed to go through a population from coast to coast and then, then they kill themselves off uh, after a few weeks. And that was in the British uh, newspaper, the Daily Mail, a whole half page on that. Uh, they can program viruses or bacteria just like nano robots. You know, before I take this one caller that's been holding a long time, uh, I did want to ask you, what kind of hope do you see, let's say just from your, your point of view, uh, that we can stop this? This is something that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years. What makes us think that we can even stop it? Well, I always say it's the strangest thing. We're all taught that we our only duty is to vote. We're, we're taught that, and, and sure enough, people vote, and, and, and the same agenda steamrolls ahead regardless of who's in power. And I, I, I tell them all, you know, if you give power to someone who's going to make laws which will affect your life, you better find out who they are, even at your local level, and you must have it on the books openly. What organizations, secret organizations, or organizations with secrets, as they phrase it, uh, they belong to, and, and what ones they've given oaths to, and what those oaths were. 
that's got to be out in the open because you'll find most of the politicians, even, even the petty ones down to local level, belong to one of the many, many uh, branches of Freemasonry. Right. So e- they, even the ones who count the votes. So you're you're starting out by saying the one hope we can do is by start demanding we know who these people are uh-huh. by outing them, so to speak, and then what can we do? Well, it's, it's like Kennedy said. That's why I put that up on the website, uh, cu- cutting through the matrix. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said it's got to be an open society. Government must be open to the people. It's not supposed to be a secret society unto itself with its own agenda. Yeah, and let me just mention, that was a great uh, clip. I want to thank you to, for uh, getting that and putting that out and then coming on the show. That was just a great clip because I think that will drive home to many people uh, that are on uh, the borderline. Uh, I want to get to people that are not uh, yet aware of what's happening in our country. And I think that'll show you, that'll show many people what really he knew back then and what uh, and how they killed him. Yes, and, and, and everything uh, he said is happening now. You, you have a totalitarian system under the guise of security, exactly what he was warning about, and and uh, you're losing all your rights. Right. Let me get to uh, Charles in Texas. He's been holding on a long time. Charles, you're on the investigative journal. Yeah, I had a couple of questions for your guest, and I had a... I mean, I mean, comments for the guests, and I had a question for you, uh, Greg. All right. Okay, uh, my comments are, George Washington, he, for the last 20 years of his life, he did not attend the Free uh, uh, Masonic Lodge, and he also spoke out against the, the Jacobins and the Illuminati. I think America at one point was completely uh, independent of the New World Order and uh, the Vatican and, and all the European powers. Also, uh, John Cecil, Cecil John Rhodes, he talked about reclaiming uh, the, the American colonies, it, meaning that they were independent of England. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and well, you'll find Washington's statement if you read it carefully. Um, what he said was he was well aware that the Illuminati had infiltrated uh, the American lodges. He didn't say much more about it. And uh, again, when you retire, you're, you're always a mason. When you're when you when you're raised to apotheosis, which is the highest level, you cannot go any further. You're once a mason, always a mason. Yeah. Okay. okay, Greg. Uh, my my, co- my question for you is: Are you located in Texas now? What's that? No, I'm in Canada. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Greg. I'm talking oh. about Greg. Right now, I'm in Texas. Yes. Because I noticed your your address had changed. Yes. Where were you located before? Like South Dakota or somewhere? Well, you know, I was located originally in Chicago, and then I traveled all over the place. And uh, I don't like to go back into every place I've been. I mean, I, last place I was after before this was in Idaho. And you're in Copeland, Texas? Where's that? Well, put it this It's near Austin. You just okay. do a Google search. Anybody can find it uh, not far away. Okay, thank you. No problem.